Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Taxel Insiders. I'm your host. I'm Brian Seidensticker. I'm the CEO of Taxel Resources. And with me today, I have a couple uh, awesome guests with me. I guess Matt, A.B., and and uh, Jonah Samples, both with Nelson Mullins. And Matt, I know we've, we've talked several times in the past. Uh, Jonah, I've met you in person, although I, this is your first time on the podcast. Welcome, both of you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on. As there's there's uh, very rarely in this industry have I ever said as exciting times, <laughs> but I think this is one of the the few times you can uh, legitimately say that and be true um, because of of all the, the the changes coming potentially coming or or the at least discussion around this Tyler versus Hennepin uh, Supreme Court case. And uh, Matt, you and I connected uh, well, a couple months ago on the subject at the time, um, you know, you, you were putting together, Nelson Mullins was putting together an, an amicus brief um, on behalf of NTLA, you know, for that case. Um, and I think we left that with a, well, we expect, you know, some sort of decision maybe maybe by the end of June. Um, and I think coming out of that, uh, we, we found that, uh, you know, they actually ruled uh, a lot quicker than anticipated. Um, and there's already, you know, I guess stuff moving and that's what I, what I want to, you know, talk about today. But before we dive into the, you know, I'll say the, the fallout or the, or the, or the, you know, effects of that. So let's take a step back and maybe talk about a little, a little background on what the case was all about. And, and Jonah, I know you had a, a big hand in putting all of that together for that amicus brief. And, uh, can you just, you know, give us a little background on, on the case, why it made it to where it's at and, and, um, and, and go from there. Sure. Yeah. And so, I pre- first of all, appreciate you having me on. But from from the background here, so it started with a an elderly woman by the name of Geraldine Tyler. So, and and in 1999, she had purchased a one bedroom condo for her to live in, right? And then by 2010, she was in you know getting up there in age. She was in her 90s, and she had decided that at that point she was going to move into. A, a more of assisted living type situation of the place that you know she would have the help that she needed. So that would that's the fact pattern that stage all of this. So in 2010 she makes the move and she immediately abandons the old condo, stops making property tax payments at the time. And so by 2011 she has completely stopped paying property taxes on the property. So under you know Minnesota law in 2012 her you know it was it was sold to the state by auction and then she had three years to redeem the the back taxes on the property. And so by the time you get to, by 2015, she had owned around $2,300 in property taxes with penalties, interest and, and, and whatnot. Um, and then that had increased by, you know, the time you get to, to 2016 when her property is sold to around $15,000. So there's about $15,000 ultimately that she had owed in, in taxes and that end fees. Um, 2016, her property is then sold, the condo sold for forty thousand dollars, and so the there in in Minnesota, there's no surplus back to you know Miss Tyler, and so at that time, that's when the action is ultimately brought, and so there is a lawsuit brought, not over any concerns with you know the noticing requirements or any issues with with the tax payments, because I mean the facts are clear; she did not make the payments. The issue was specifically challenging the Minnesota structure as it deals with the surplus payments, because the argument here at the district court, the circuit court, and ultimately the Supreme Court of the United States was that the she had a, a, a property interest in the equity that she had built in that condo. And Minnesota law did not allow her the opportunity to get that surplus. And so at the at the circuit court level, which is you know one level below the Supreme Court of the United States, the Circuit Court found that because of the structure of the Minnesota statute, that the structure set forth that they that she is not entitled to surplus, and so therefore there's no property interest in that surplus, and the takings clause is not an issue here. So the takings clause in the Constitution, I mean, you you may have heard the word kilo thrown around just in passing at some points. That's a pretty big case on this issue, but essentially the argument here from the takings clause perspective is that she owed. Or that she was owed the equity, and since the government took that, there was a taking of her private property, and therefore she was was owed some sort of just compensation. 
Um, there was so then the case ultimately goes to the Supreme Court of the United States. And at that point, you know, there there's a uh, granting of certiary, which is, you know, the Supreme Court agrees to hear you know, the briefing, and the arguments. Um, and at that point, uh, myself, Matt, and then an, another partner of ours, Martin, we get involved with drafting a, a brief at the uh, at the, the merit stage, an amicus brief on behalf of NTLA, the Arizona County Treasury Association and the Tax Collectors and Treasury Association of New Jersey. Um, there are there were really three major points that we that we were trying to get across in that briefing to the Supreme Court, because because as an amicus, our idea well amicus, which is Latin for like friend of the court. So we are trying to inform the court of our client's specific position as it relates to this case and the concerns we have outside of the legalese of these problems here. So the first thing we really wanted to stress was to the Supreme Court that there are different types of sales and different statutory schemes in each of the different states. And, and I'll cite like uh, one of my law school professors was Judge Sutton on the Sixth Circuit, and he wrote a book called 51 Imperfect Solutions, which I think is a really good, you know, short little phrase that describes what we were really getting at in our brief is that there are in each state, you know, there's lien states, there's sales states, there's all sorts of different mechanisms for each state to to do tax collection from a real property perspective and, you know, ultimately sales, whether it be a lien sale or just, you know, deed sale or however the state ends up doing it. But each state has their own system. And so, and one, one section specifically in our brief, we talk about, you know, the West Virginia system, which was recently revamped is there is a, uh, the state auditor's office is now in charge of dealing with, you know, the, the sales and, and the noticing requirements for the entire state when it used to be the sheriff's offices. And there's actually a publication on the auditor's office that we cited in a brief that that specifically outlines that part of the reason for that was based on policy considerations for how the state wants the sales to go and, and who they want to purchase. And, and there's a there's a preference maybe towards ownership as opposed to, you know, sales to the out of state investors. And so that that was something that the auditor's office made, you know, to the legislature and the legislature codified this. But that's not something you're going to see in the state code. That's just the reasoning behind it. And so mm. we cite to that as an example of each state has the particular reasons for setting forth their statutory schemes. And we were, you know, cautioning the Supreme Court of the United States to, to consider that if you made a sweeping decision here that completely revamps all these decisions, you know, the, the each individual state's statutory scheme, that there would be, you know, a variety of concerns just from like a federalism perspective. Um, you know, the, the, the second and third things that we really focused on in our brief was, you know, that there are there are many, many steps taken by the states to ensure that there are not, you know, that, that, that there are that the sales are a remedy of last resort. And so there's a lot of opportunities and each state has their own different section of how they this is lined out. But there's lots of different opportunities to to, you know, do your pay pay your back taxes or pay your back fees or, or and and but before you ultimately get to a sale and so each state has their own different system and so we don't want some sort of disruption to that just based on there being an, an unnecessarily broad opinion from the supreme court got it um and that was a really good summary of of what we were trying to what uh well you guys attempted to try to tell the court and and uh, i guess maybe that's a good segue into talking a little bit about you know, what the court said as a decision. Um, and based on what you just mentioned, Jonah, I would say you know, mainly got a kind of a, a best case scenario. I mean, they, maybe the best, depending on the, the side of, of the case you're on, but, uh, you know, a, a, you know, maybe the best case from an investor's perspective is it gets thrown out, right? They don't, they're, they're done with that, right? Um, a, a worst case scenario, right, that uh, the oversweeping would be a, you know, Tax sales in general are not constitutional. I, I don't think anybody thought that was possible, but that would be a earth shattering. All right, this industry is 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 in flux <laughs> beyond anything that it's ever seen in its history, um, and that's not what the court said. So, um, and I, I'm pro I know I'm going to oversimplify this, Matt, um, but you know my understanding of of what the the court basically said was, um, okay, Minnesota. Your your process is somewhat broken in the fact that um, you know the excess proceeds that the state statutes say are totally legal to keep. We you know the Supreme Court is saying that that 
that's not the case, right? But they didn't go anything beyond that as far as, you know, it has to be this way. It has to, I, I think, um, I, I like to think that they, maybe they listened to your your you know three bullet points of please don't make this over over overarching because each state is different each state has its own process and and if you are too broad in this statement you will have much larger ramifications from that and i i think uh, i like to think maybe the court listened to that and said okay we're going to make a decision and we're going to keep it as focused to what we think the key issue is which they had said is the is the 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 state, right, in that case, or the county keeping those excess proceeds, or not, I I don't think they, even that was the issue, is that they didn't make it available for the previous owner to at least have an option, right? So I know I'm probably oversimplifying that, Matt. Um, So help help me and the listeners better understand what exactly the court said. Yeah, for sure. And and of course, Jonah and I would would love to to say that the court exactly listened to us and and adopted everything we said. That'd be a nice little feather in our cap. But it, the opinion really was a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, you know, there's some good things in there for the industry. Um, the fact that that didn't go so far as to say uh, a certain type of tax sale is, is unconstitutional um, or a, you know, a particular method of actually auctioning these properties off is, is unconstitutional. The court didn't go anywhere near that. Um, you're, you're right in saying that it was a it was a very limited um, opinion because everybody in front of the court, um, even Miss Tyler herself, had agreed that the the county and and local state actors have to have the ability to sell your property for non-payment of taxes. So that was a, a foregone conclusion, really, that uh, tax sales were going to survive this. Now, will they look the same after Tyler across the country? I don't think so. I, I think that there are going to be a number of um, uh, tax sale statutes that are going to be attacked across the country by um, the same uh, group that uh, that was representing Miss Tyler, uh, known as uh, Pacific Legal Foundation. They have some brilliant attorneys over there that are very well versed in these uh, takings issues and protecting private property rights. So um, you can bet that they're going to use the opinion uh, to try and attack some statutory schemes in other states. Um, but it's not necessarily going to be a slam dunk because there's there's still even after the Tyler opinion, there's still going to be some nuances and some variances across the country. So um, in before Tyler, the court really looked at as the first part of the the takings analysis. And we and when we say takings, we're talking about the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which applies to the states uh, through the the due process clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. And so the first step in that takings analysis is whether or not a property right has been taken. Um, Property rights can be a lot of things. Uh, Obviously, a a state law that creates a property right is a a very clear way to see um, exactly what is protected. Um, But what the court said is looking at state law alone can't be the only source of property rights. You also have to look at history and precedent to figure out if you have a protected interest in your property. And that can attach, of course, and depending on the the different state law, to financial interest in in that property. So in this case, uh, home equity is what Ms. Tyler was claiming was her property right. So the court did is it broadened uh, the way that you look at property rights, but it stopped short of saying nationwide, there is a 50 state property right to surplus proceeds or property right to equity. Instead, it said, again, look at state laws as you know, your first source and then check uh, state history and precedent. And it turned out in Minnesota, equity was protected as a property right in other situations like traditional foreclosures um, or even uh, before uh, Minnesota changed to its current tax uh, forfeiture um, uh, collection mechanism that they have in place now. So you look at other uh, history and precedent within the state. So that's one thing that it did. Um, But the court also went on to say that the the county can't take more or the state, whether it's a municipality, the state, the county, whoever is doing the tax collection, can't take more than what's actually owed uh, in order to uh, to recover the delinquent taxes. Um, and they kind of used a little bit of a flashy quote here uh, that this kind of get catching everybody's eye, which is the taxpayer must render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but no more. 
And the thought process there is that you can't just take uh, the full interest in a piece of property when only selling a, a fraction of that interest would do. Um, there are, of course, a lot of ways that you can interpret that, and it can have a lot of different applications depending upon the type of tax sale that you're looking at for each state. Um, but in Minnesota, Minnesota didn't distinguish between you know, fractional interest of property uh, or have any type of mechanism where the property was sold at some sort of public auction. Instead, the full amount of the title forfeited to uh, the local municipality or, or to the local county. And so that meant that Caesar was getting paid more than what Caesar was owed. And the court said that that's a, a classic taking uh, without just compensation. Um, but of course, the court didn't determine what the just compensation was, you know, what Ms. Tyler was owed. It didn't tell us how to calculate that just compensation. It also didn't tell us who would have to pay the just compensation. Um, so it remanded uh, the case or, or sent the case back down to the lower courts to apply its opinion and figure out those other kind of authority issues and, and how the opinion would be applied. Um, but essentially what the court's doing is you, you got to look back at traditional property law principles uh, in order to figure out if there's a protected interest at stake here as your, your first part of the analysis. And that expands from just looking at whatever state law is on the books. You got to look a little bit broader uh, than that for, uh, for a, a post Tyler taking. So, you know, it's going to impact the industry. There are certainly some states that have uh, statutory schemes that uh, might be thought of as safe. You know, generally, if a uh, state has a, a tax sale process by which there's a judicial sale of the property for market value, um, it's going to be pretty hard to, uh, to have a taking in that scenario. So long as there's an opportunity for a homeowner uh, to, to make a claim for the surplus proceeds. But then there are also some that are that are kind of a, a middle ground, right? That are that are maybe on the maybe on the margins a little bit, where there's a type of judicial sale, but it's not really for fair market value, um, and then maybe there's no opportunity for the homeowner to uh, claim the surplus. Well, I, I think those states might have to to start what could be a tough conversation about. Do we need to make some tweaks uh, either through the process uh, at the local level or the legislature stepping in to see if uh, if there's going to be any uh, any tweaks overall to the process? Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying any of this is, is clear cut. I mean, it's it's the way that this is going to progress. And this is kind of how Supreme Court cases operate is uh, a new principle is kind of handed down from the Supreme Court, uh, applying a, a traditional uh, understanding of a constitutional amendment to a new area of, of, of law or to a new scenario. And the courts below start to kind of uh, wrestle with that decision and apply it to even different factual scenarios. And then that's how the law ultimately develops. And so what we're going to see over the next couple months is we're going to see courts struggling to figure out um, is a, a tax sale uh, procedure, for instance, an interest rate bid down method. Um, certain states use that where the, the, uh, the bidder comes to the tax sale and pays just the taxes, fees and costs that are due. And they bid down the interest rate that they are going to receive for that property. And then mm -hmm. at the end of a three or five year period, they get title to the property after foreclosing the right of redemption. Well, there are going to be courts that are going to have to wrestle with, is that statute constitutional? Um, is there a property right? And it's going to depend, of course, state by state on that uh, traditional property law in that state and the historical practice and precedent uh, within the state to determine if there's a taking. So um, kind of a mixed bag. I wouldn't say anything's clear cut, uh, but I, I think what we can say and, and put the industry's mind at ease uh, by saying that local governments can still sell property for delinquent taxes, um, whether it's a tax deed sale or a lien auction or, or some kind of other process where there's uh, securitization, the court didn't say that any of those are unconstitutional on their face. So there will still be tax sales after the Tyler opinion. So it's safe to say, uh, you know, I'd say investors and and uh, local government, you know, treasurers and and they, there's no need to like totally freak out, right? This is not the sky is not falling, right? This is a a shift 
in maybe some states, right? But that doesn't say every state, right? It could be some, it could be none, it could be many, it could be few, right? I think that's what that's what's going to be decided really at the state level, right, Matt? That that's right. Now, now okay. I will tell you there there are people out there who are targeting uh, somewhere between twelve and fourteen states that they claim have statutory schemes that would violate Tyler's uh, uh, holding. Um, but so far, the court has not struck down any of those uh, state statutes, mm -hmm. um, yeah. with the exception of potentially Nebraska. Um, there has been an opinion from the U.S. Supreme Court sending a case back to the Nebraska Supreme Court saying, hey, why don't you just reconsider your prior ruling now that we've issued this Tyler opinion? Um, so the Supreme Court hadn't said Nebraska is unconstitutional, but it has given the Nebraska Supreme Court the chance to look at its statutory mm -hmm. scheme uh, under this new new opinion. Um, but you're right. No, no other states have been uh, struck down or anything of the sort. I do think, though, that this is probably a time when some of these other states could start looking at their practices um, to see whether or not they need to whether or not their uh, state law considers uh, equity a property right. And if so, they might have to make some tweaks uh, in how their tax sale uh, process goes going forward. It's, um, I want to circle back on Nebraska, if you, if you know more about that case. Uh, but are there any other states that you're aware of, Matt or Jonah, where you know similar, I'll say, le leveraging the Thailand versus Hennepin in in some uh, in court cases at a state level? Is there anything other than Nebraska that you're aware of? Yeah, so so there, there's been a couple, and and you know as Matt did a good explanation of the Nebraska case, but I mean the one of the things to remember here is that if a case goes to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court of the United States grants certiorari, a lot of the reason for that is because there's been a circuit split, right? So that so the different circuits underneath the Supreme Court have come out with different decisions based on their interpretation of the law. And then it goes to the Supreme Court, and then the Supreme Court makes the final, you know, gavel the hammer down of this is this is on this specific issue. And so uh, there, there's one particular example of in Michigan, there, there's a currently a cert petition pending before the Supreme Court of the United States that the Sixth Circuit had come down the other way. So the, the Sixth Circuit had already kind of held similar to the Tyler holding. And then the county actually appealed from the circuit court to try and uh, you know overturn that base, but now that the Tyler case has come out, there's there's a brief in opposition to the uh, district of certiorari saying you've already decided this issue. There's no longer a circuit split, and so you know to to the extent that there's there's a concern here that there's you know there's going to be this mass overturning of, of statutes statutory schemes. Some of the circuits have already been operating under this system, and so that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, I I did you know do some research and found that there, there's actually interesting, and this is just kind of a, a small case study here, of there's a, uh, a case that was recently decided on, on June the 9th in the Superior Court of New Jersey, where in, in that specific case, the, uh, there was, you know, there was a sale, there's the back taxes, there's, there's the right of redemption, and, and the, uh, the, the individual taxpayer here through the litany of challenges. So there was a challenge there, there were arguments that there was, you know, because of COVID-19 pandemic that they weren't aware of the, the, the note, they didn't receive notice. And, you know, every the litany of the things that you'd see in this industry trying to challenge a quiet title action where they were trying to force the sale. And so at the Superior Court of New Jersey, it was interesting because all of those arguments were thrown down. This was this was after a quiet title action was already granted. It goes up on appeal. And there, there's, you know, determination that proper notice was sent. There's, you know, all these issues and, and part of the but there was a small argument in the motion for reconsideration that was before the Superior Court that had an ex, you know, part of it was I looked at literally I looked at my house on Zillow and I think it's worth this much. And so now, like, I, I, I should see that equity. And so the the state court issued an opinion remanding it down based on the Tyler case. Now, I, the, the remand doesn't say, you know, you, that there's the New Jersey statutory scheme is, you know, illegal or there's some big issue. All it says is that now we need to consider this. And so this kind of hits on Matt's point when we talked about the Nebraska case earlier is, is there's, you're going to, you're probably going to see a lot of remands down to where I need you to specifically consider trial court, you know, 
intermediate court these issues that were raised in Tyler to determine whether or not your statutory scheme violates the, the takings clause as analyzed by Tyler. So you've got, you know, the, the three examples we kind of we've kind of pulled here that Matt was talking about is there's the you know, there's the Nebraska case where that went up to the Supreme Court and that's already been mm -hmm. remanded down. There's cases that were already appealing decisions from from circuits that were already following the Tyler precedent. And now you've got state courts that are starting to consider the takings clause issues from Tyler. And so I think you're going to see a wide gambit of that. But that that's kind of where we stand in the you know month and a half or so since we've had the Tyler decision. So is it uh, so Nebraska, Michigan, you mentioned New Jersey, were there any other states that you're aware of where there's a state level or some case going on that is maybe referencing the Tyler Hennepin decision? As yeah, of today, so, anyway, I'm sure there'll be more, well, but as of today, yeah, as of today, those are those are the three main ones. Um, but but one thing you can't just look at are, are the cases, right? right? So there are certainly those. It, the this Tyler opinion is going to percolate, is the the phrase a lot of attorneys use, percolate through the lower courts um, until we figure out exactly what the the breadth of the decision is. But then you also got to look to state legislatures. Are they going to start making tweaks? And we know of uh, bills that at the time of the uh, the court was considering the Tyler case, we knew that there had been, I don't know, five bills that were introduced in New York to change the statutory scheme. We knew that there was one pending, I believe, in South Dakota. And then in the wake of Tyler, there have also been bills introduced in other states. I know New Jersey has a bill that's pending right now, which make a minor tweak to its process. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're going to you're going to see this decision is going to impact not only the state courts and the federal courts, but also the state legislatures as they try to make uh, some changes to uh, to address the decision. Um, so, you know, it's it's interesting, though, because the Tyler opinion doesn't really deal with um, the front end of the tax sale process. It deals somewhat with the, the back end about how the, the uh, proceeds that are uh, obtained through the tax sale process then are distributed. And so to some extent, that's hard to go back and fix um, for tax sales that have already occurred. Um, mm -hmm. But the court didn't exactly say that any one process is is correct uh, or unconstitutional. And it also didn't say what happens to the tax sales that have already occurred. So we're going to see a lot of activity in the uh, in this arena going forward, um, not just to, to tweak the, the procedures in each uh, state that might be impacted going forward, but also trying to figure out how trying to figure out how the uh, cases are going to uh, change the thing uh, for tax sales or change the process for tax sales that have already occurred. Got it. So I think it's safe to, well, it's definitely safe to say that uh, for those that are like, ah, it started in Minnesota, this is isolated to Minnesota, that's obviously not the case, right? This is going to have far more reaching ramifications potentially, right, in some states. Um, is you think it's also safe to say Matt and Jonah, like, we'll probably still be talking about this in 10 years because of all the potential changes and the time it takes to work that stuff out. This is this is not going to be an an overnight sweeping. OK, everything changes. Right. This is probably going to be uh, a multi year, if not multi decade. Right. Slogging it out state by state through court by court. And eventually it's just change more change that was likely already in process or an argument, right? Before Tyler had been like Michigan was, you just stated. Is that safe yeah, to say? That, that, that is, and, and we know that um, state legislatures have been making some small tweaks uh, to their tax sale procedures as they, they deal with surplus proceeds. Or as Jonah mentioned, West Virginia doing a complete overhaul uh, for modernization and other reasons. And so um, this was kind of already in the works behind the scenes and, and on a state by state basis. Um, I think this might speed up some of those changes in uh, in some of the states where uh, the tax sale procedure is already somewhat under attack. Um, but it doesn't mean that tomorrow uh, the tax sale statute is going to just completely be rewritten in whatever state you're investing in. Um, right. It's going to be a process that takes some time, um, but it is going to change the way that the tax sale industry looks at tax sales and looks at the constitutionality of them. Because for a while we used to think, well, if you got good notice uh, before the tax sale, and you had all these resources that were available to help somebody avoid 
losing their home at tax sale, well, they got due process. And so that was the end of it. But the Tyler case says, you know, due process is one thing. Um, and the ability to, for instance, sell your home before a tax sale to protect your equity, that's one thing. But that's not a substitute for the just compensation that you're owed if a taking occurs. So um, Tyler's going to change the way that we look at tax sales and think about them. Um, but as you said, not going to be overnight. Right. And I, I did uh, just a couple interesting pieces. Well, for anybody that's active in West, West Virginia, um, I am talking to uh, Randy Saunders, also part of the Nelson Mullins group, Matt and uh, Jonah Nomewell. But uh, we'll be talking about West Virginia um, in an upcoming episode as well because of the sweeping changes there. That was totally unrelated to Tyler Hennepin. It's just changes that they made. Um, and then I also was speaking um, separately to uh, Stephen Morrell, who's active in the committee that was already changing their statutes down in, in Louisiana. Also totally separate from... Um, Tyler versus Hennepin. But because of Tyler versus Hennepin, they decided, hey, maybe there's a couple of tweaks that we could make that would make it uh, more in line with the outcome of, of Tyler versus Hennepin. So they're being very proactive. And I think it's just good good practice, right, for um, you know folks that are looking, if the hood's already open, right, and if there's some changes that might be made to, to make it more in line, right? It might save a whole lot of heartache later if you can make those changes now versus re, rehashing it over and over in, in future court cases. Um, that's, I'm not an attorney, but that's just my opinion. But um, I guess, uh, Matt, Jonah, um, I one want to thank you guys for your time, not only on this, putting together the Mika's brief and all the, the effort you guys have put in so far. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking about this again for many years. Um, is there anything else you think is, is critical for our, our listeners to, to know as of today? It, no, I, I don't think so. I think it's just something from an industry perspective. Um, it's an, an invitation to be proactive, um, whether that's proactively involved in your state legislatures and trying to uh, uh, discuss changes that might be needed, or it's proactively looking at your portfolios and, and trying to uh, measure this risk and, and bake it into your analysis. I think it's better to do that uh, on the front end than um, try to be uh, on the try to try to fix everything on the back end when uh, you're you're already stuck. So mm -hmm. uh, being proactive, I think, is going to help us in the industry, um, and might avoid a situation where we're in front of a court trying to explain to uh, a number of judges or justices that have never dealt with the tax sale industry before, and trying to explain to them what the procedure is like. Um, so I think it's something we can all get out in front of. Agree, one hundred percent. Well, Matt, Jonah, thank you guys again. I uh, can't wait to, to talk more about this in the future. All right. Good luck, everybody.